Hello and welcome to Inside View. I am your host, Joel Metzger. And joining me on the show today is Congressman Tom McClintock. He represents California's 4th District. Tom, welcome. Joel, thanks again for having me. Well, really a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for making the time to come out to Calaveras County and, and address the residents here. We really appreciate that. It is that. always a pleasure. Thank you. Well, there are many issues that we want to get into, um, but I think one of the things that's really uh, affecting Calaveras County and, in fact, the whole Sierra Nevada region right now is tree mortality. We mm -hmm. are seeing so many conifers die, um, due in part to uh, uh, the drought, but also the beetle is really what's kind of uh, sealing the deal with them. So uh, are, you, are, are you familiar and hearing from constituents oh, about yes. this oh, issue? Uh, 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 it, it, it is a crisis, and the fire that we're likely to have as a result this summer could be absolutely catastrophic. Move We've already lost a thousand square miles of forest land just in this one congressional district alone uh, uh, over the past three years to catastrophic wildfire. But this is not a beetle issue, it's not a drought issue, it's the fact that the trees can no longer resist the droughts and uh, uh, pest and disease infestations that they are normally able to resist when they're healthy and strong. The problem is of uh, we've stopped thinning our forests 40 years ago. Uh, trees that used to have plenty of room to grow and thrive are now fighting for their lives against other trees trying to uh, occupy the same ground. And in that weakened condition, in that stressed condition, uh, uh, they have much more difficult times surviving outside stressors uh, like pestilence or, uh, and drought. Uh, uh, the amount of groundwater that is absorbed by these o catastrophically overgrown forests is enormous. Uh, had they been properly thinned, even in a drought, there would have been sufficient water to keep the uh, trees healthy. Uh, when beetles bore into trees, the tree's natural defense is to secrete uh, sap that kills them on the spot, uh, uh, suffocates them. Uh, the problem is, uh, in a stressed condition, they cannot create the sap that's necessary to stop these beetles, so the beetle comes in and kills the trees. Uh, we've now lost 85% of the pine stock in the uh, Sierra National Forest to bark beetles, and that infestation is growing and it's moving, moving north. Well, that's terrifying for Calaveras County. We were just added to uh, one of the counties that's in a state of emergency and, and part of the task force, the tree mortality task force. Uh, but we know we haven't even seen close to the worst of it yet. Just yep. 12 meters to the south of us is already starting to get quite a few dead right. trees. And here's, here's the math of it. Uh, uh, once this acreage is destroyed, uh, uh, whether by the stresses of drought, bark beetles, whatever, it costs about $1,600 per acre to come in, clear out that dead wood, and replant. Of, uh, we've got 193 million acres of national forest land alone. You can do the math on that. There's not enough money there to begin to make a dent. The good news is that within those 193 million acres, if we were properly thinning the forests so that they would be resistant to uh, drought and pestilence and disease, uh, we could be generating, and we used to generate, about $300 per acre per year from that acreage. Uh, uh, that could, over time, repay the reclamation costs uh, that are currently beyond reach. The problem is we can't do that as long as the environmental laws that are in place make it cost prohibitive. Um, you know, w the National Forest Service typically loses money on timber sales. Uh, uh, which is a remarkably difficult thing to do in the timber industry, but it's because of the enormous amounts of time and resources that are consumed to meet environmental demands. Um, and the irony is this. We've had those environmental laws in place now for 40 years. For 40 years, the environmentalists promised us that these laws would improve the forest environment. And I think after 40 years of experience with these laws, we're now entitled to ask, how's the forest environment doing? And the answer is absolutely damning. You can see it all around us. So, so policies that not only failed to achieve their objectives, but actually accomplished the opposite of their objectives, uh, uh, once we observe that, maybe it's time to go back and revisit those policies. The House did that with the Resilient Federal Forest Act last year. It begins to relax the restrictions that are keeping us from properly maintaining our forests. Uh, uh, it passed on a bipartisan vote out of the House. Uh, it's being blocked by Senate Democrats at the behest of the president. Uh, and that's a tune that we hear over and over again. There's another component to this that I think is crucial, and that's the component of fire. Mm -hmm. Not only has logging been stopped in many areas, but fire has been suppressed. 
How big of a deal is that as part of this unhealthy forest result? Well, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the loss of proper forest management 40 years ago has made these catastrophic fires now commonplace. Uh, I was up at the uh, command center at the King Fire uh, two years ago. Uh, and usually when you go to command center, um, it, it, they're very, you know, these are professionals. They're calm, they're analytical, they're in control of things. Uh, they were scared that day. Uh, 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 they thought they were going to lose both Georgetown and Forest Hill to this fire. The entire towns of Georgetown and Forest Hill, they were expecting to be wiped out. Uh, and by the way, had that happened, that fire would have then gone on and just decimated the Tahoe Basin, uh, which has about four times the fuel load it's supposed to have right now. Um, and one of the firefighters, one of the old guys, with tears in his eyes, comes up to me and he says, Congressman, I can't even get to this fire on the ground. We used to have good timber roads. I could get equipment in there. I could, get, I could put these fires out. On the... He says, I can't even get to them now. All I can do is drop stuff from the air and pray to God the wind shifts. And if the wind hadn't shifted that day, Georgetown and Forest Hill would be history. And to bring this closer to home, the Butte fire just completely devastated Calaveras County due to similar circumstances. Fuel load that had not been managed for up to 100 years in some cases. Yeah, when I was at the command center for, for Butte, I asked the, uh, uh, the firefighters there, you know, what message can I carry back to Congress in your name? And what they said was, tell them that treatment, forest treatment works. Where the land was properly treated, the fire slowed, we were able to extinguish it. Uh, but there's not enough of it out there anymore. And, and the reason is because the environmental laws have made it impossible for us to manage these lands. Well, and I, I want to touch on, on natural fire one more time, because if you go back to the earliest pictures of California, they show nothing like the forest that we see today. Mm -hmm. it's, it's widely spaced trees, large trees, and that's because we had frequent low-intensity fires that did not get into the crown and kill everything. Mm -hmm. So before there was ever a tree cut down by a chainsaw, that nature was managing the forest well. Is there a component of allowing more well, it, fires it, it to It was and in? it wasn't. You know, as Hobbes said, in nature, uh, uh, the, the state of life is uh, uh, nasty, brutal, and short. Uh, um, we decided long ago that to preserve the, the forests for future generations, we would manage those uh, forests. That means we wouldn't allow fires to wipe out entire sections of land and require 100 years before those, uh, those forests came back. We would properly manage them. We would take out the, uh, uh, the big trees before they burned, uh, uh, giving plenty of room for new trees to, to, to grow. Um, those are the policies that the last 40 years have reversed. And, um, uh, and now we have catastrophically overgrown forests, and now fire is taking them out. You know, one forester told me a long time ago, all that excess timber comes out of the forest one way or another. It's either carried out or it's burned out, but it comes out. When we carried it out, we had healthier forests, and we had a thriving economy. Uh, and because we had fewer forest fires, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, those forests available for the public to enjoy year after year. When the radical environmentalists took control of these policies and reversed them, we've seen exactly the opposite. Now, catastrophically overgrown forests, uh, as I said, a thousand square miles of of incinerated forest land just within this district alone over the last three years and, and trees falling victim to disease and pestilence and ultimately catastrophic wildfire. And, and this is an absolute crisis because it's just too big. I mean, yeah. we, we cannot fix this problem in a year. I mean, this would be 10, 20 years of dedicated huge funds to actually go and thin the forest. So that seems insurmountable. How do well, we handle I'm, I'm, this? I'm working on legislation right now that will uh, uh, dedicate about $300 million a year to reclamation of that, you know, those lands that uh, have been declared uh, uh, disasters by the, by the states. Uh, it would be repaid over f a five-year period by uh, restoring timber sales to the remaining healthy acreage that we have, get that excess timber out before it burns, and then use the proceeds of that to pay for the reclamation that's now required. Uh, you know, one of the great ironies is um, the public lands are, are such now just a disaster. The private lands that are not subject to a lot of these environmental regulations are very well managed. And I got that lesson touring the, um, uh, the King Fire uh, site last year. This was one year after the fire. It was a year ago. Uh, uh, the fire was two years ago. Uh, as we flew over, you could tell exactly 
where the public lands stopped and the private lands managed by Sierra Pacific Industries began. Uh, the, the public lands uh, looked like a giant had taken 40-foot toothpicks and just stuck them side by side as far as you could see. The moment they hit that property line, you could see how the fire began to slow and break up because those lands had been properly thinned and managed, and when, they, when the fire slowed and began to break up, they could put it out. The areas of the private lands that had been destroyed by the fire had been completely salvaged. A portion of the salvage proceeds had then be, been used, and they were in the process then of replanting those forests. So within a couple of years, the private lands killed by the fire are going to be green, healthy, thriving young forests. On the public side of that same property line, uh, uh, the, the lands were completely abandoned. Within a couple of years, uh, 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 four to eight feet of dry brush, four to six feet of dry brush is going to grow up uh, because uh, brush has first claim on fire damaged land. Uh, and then those big, dead, dry trees that, the, uh, that we never salvaged uh, are going to start falling on top of it, and you're going to have a perfect fire stack for a second generation fire. And then that will completely incinerate everything again. We're back to brush. Yep. And, so, and sterilize the uh, the soil at the same time. That's how intense those second generation fires can be. What would be the number of years until we would see a timber stand? About a century. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nature will reclaim the land, but it will take about a hundred years. Wow. I mean, that's so not in our lifetimes. Correct. Correct. Or, or for, for that matter, in, in, in many of our children's lifetimes either. You know, that's why proper forest management is essential. That's why the Resilient Federal Forest Act of, of 2015, which restores proper forest management practices, is so essential. Uh, uh, that, I think, is why it passed the House on a bipartisan vote and why it is so outrageous that Senate Democrats and the Obama administration would be blocking it in the Senate. Does that act allow management to it be expanded even on the wilderness and forest service it's lands? Specifically, and all that? yeah, it, it specifically uh, would apply to forest service land. Of, uh, it would allow a categorical exclusion from from NEPA and the environmental laws uh, for uh, uh, forest thinning of uh, thirty thousand acre uh, projects of thirty thousand acres uh, that had gone through a collaborative uh, uh, planning process. Meaning, you bring in all sides and you work out a, uh, a forest management plan. Uh, it also uh, uh, writes the problem we have with uh, 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 borrowing of management funds for firefighting. We're in a negative feedback loop now as, as, more, as we have more and more fires and have to spend more and more money for those, to suppress those fires. Uh, that ends up being taken out of uh, forest prevention funding. Um, as we deplete our forest prevention funds, we have more fires. As we have more fires, we deplete more of our fire prevention funds, and we enter a negative feedback loop. Uh, the Resilient Federal Forest Act would uh, allow uh, the big uh, fires to be treated the same way as any other natural disaster and funded that way and would prevent the transfer of funds being used to manage our lands and prevent fires from uh, being transferred over to having to fight them. So I, I, I can see, foresee an issue with managing the lands because we're going to have a surplus of timber because these trees are dead right now, and I don't even think that, well, that they're, this they're, could go through in yeah, it's time. Not, it's not, no, no, no. I mean, uh, Churchill's, what, what Churchill called history's terrible, chilling words, too late, uh, are about to be pronounced on our forest management policy. How much time do you have to get a tree out of the forest after it's died? Uh, you have, well, it loses much of its value within one year. Uh -huh. It loses all of its value within two. That's why you see the private landowners after a fire, they come through and they immediately salvage their, uh, their timber uh, because they can still uh, 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 sell it and use that money to replant. Um, they're not bound by the same environmental laws as the public lands. Public lands, it takes us a full year to go through an expedited uh, uh, environmental review before we can even begin thinking about putting the, um, uh, the, 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 the timber out to, uh, to auction. And by that time, that timber's lost more than half of its value. And then if an environmental group comes in and sues and gets an injunction, they can run out the clock over the, the, the remaining year until that uh, timber is worthless. That's why a lot of the auctions of fire-killed timber on public lands um, uh, go unbid on because they no longer have the value that to, to justify the fuss and bother of taking them out and milling them. Then if you get past that window when you could get any profit or, or any, any revenue off that land... Then they just sit there and how do you How do you convince someone to pay to remove them because they really... 
Well, you, you can't. You have to pay them. At that point, you have to you you have to pay somebody to come in and remove these trees uh, that uh, that have no commercial value. That's where that sixteen hundred dollars per acre of reclamation cost comes in. And the question then is, over you know, when you have uh, forest lands uh, you know that have been destroyed as vast as ours, how do you pay for that? Uh, well, I, as I said, I think we can front the money of, and have it then repaid uh, if we can establish a new revenue stream of, uh, for selling the excess timber in the healthy acreage, uh, which will allow that healthy acreage to resist fire and drought and pestilence, of, uh, and then we can use those proceeds to reclaim uh, the lands for which that prevention is now too late. But realistically we're going to see catastrophic fire in some of these areas before we can address the problem. Yes. And, and it's going to burn what's already been burned, and then eventually we're going to get down to just bare soil, and then it all starts over. We don't see timber for 100 years. Yes. In, in, in that's, probably the that's, majority. That's what our environmental laws have produced with the promise they would help our forest ecology. And, and by the way, in the meantime, wiping out huge habitats uh, for spotted owls and other endangered species, uh, all in the name of protecting them. Is there a place for letting wildfires burn and not restricting their ability to burn the way we have in this not new way of managing? Not wildfires. I mean, of, of, uh, again. Controlled uh, burns? Controlled burns that take out the, the, uh, the scrub brush. Uh, the, um, uh, the call them snags of uh, uh, the ladder fuels that ultimately threaten the big trees. Uh, that's that's the kind of fire that you're talking about. Um, but once again, there is no substitute for properly managing these lands if we want to assure that generation after generation will be able to enjoy them. As I said, we used to do that, and we had a thriving local economy based on carrying excess timber out before it burned, uh, and we had much healthier forests, much fewer and less severe forest fires. The impact of tree mortality on your constituents is a lot of dead trees on private property mm -hmm. and also on government property, uh, special district property, that need to come down because they're going to pose a danger to homes and, and other property. Mm -hmm. um, I know the state has made some funding available and, and counties have gone into emergency mode. Um, is there anything that you can do or the federal government can do to help? Well, I think one thing we have to do is look at the effect of laws that, that have made it very difficult for private homeowners to remove excess uh, uh, vegetation from their properties. Uh, I know in the Tahoe Basin that's been a very big problem. Um, uh, uh, you know, as far as you know, federal assistance, I'm, you know, that's something we can look at, but the, the fact of the matter is we have not been able to take care of our own lands uh, uh, it, it, within our national forests. And, 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 and the irony is, every year the Forest Service comes through and wants more and more money to acquire more and more tracts of land, moving them from pretty good private management into the atrocious neglect we see on the federal lands. Uh, uh, Congressman Louie Gobert of our subcommittee uh, described that as, uh, uh, she, she said the federal government starts to look like the old uh, miser in town who's got the biggest uh, house in, in town, the paint's peeling, the uh, roof is uh, collapsing, the uh, 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 grounds are overgrown with, uh, with weeds uh, because he spends all of his time and money plotting how he's going to buy up other people's property. Uh, you know, that's essentially what the federal government has been doing with uh, land management and land acquisition. What we're trying to do is shift funding for acquiring more land into taking, first taking care of the land we already own. I, I had uh, heard that FEMA may make some funds available to help with the tree removal process um, if, if that works out. Have you heard anything about that? Or I mean, uh, uh, my understanding is that we can't do that given the current... Uh, 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 limitations on FEMA funds. Uh, and uh, we have inquired as to how we can change those laws to allow these funds to be used for that purpose. The problem is that that opens up a huge can of worms uh, uh, because once you go to, to preventative measures, uh, then the question becomes, well, shouldn't we be preventing the damage caused by hurricanes and floods and so forth. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we've already explored that avenue and we got a lot of pushback on it. So I don't think that's going to be a practical. I'd like to see it but, uh, for, for, 
uh, you know, to assist people in in uh, coping with with uh, uh, removing dead timber. Uh, actually, because you know, the, the, if, if it's a beetle infestation, that beetle infestation is, is, has been spawned and generated on public lands. Uh, the private landowners uh, are then bearing the brunt of that, um, but that avenue did not look very promising when we explored it. But there certainly is state funding available to help people, and they can work through their local county government to access and, that. And, and, of course, our office will be happy to assist in, in looking for any sources of funding that might be available to an individual based upon their circumstances, but uh, I, you know, I don't want to give false hope. We, we looked at trying to get the... FEMA reforms necessary to allow that for uh, uh, prevention activities, and we ran into a dead end. Okay. Well, let me throw you a softball. Can you just explain the California water crisis to us? Well, it's real simple. Of um, uh, Droughts are nature's fault. Mm -hmm. They happen. Water shortages are our fault. Water shortages are a choice that we made a generation ago when we stopped building new reservoirs uh, uh, so that we could uh, take water from wet years so that we have plenty in dry years. Uh, uh, we now have uh, situ you know, in, in, the, the last major reservoir in this state was the New Maloney's, uh, over a million acre feet, uh, in 1979. Uh, and in that period, uh, the population has nearly doubled. Uh, we don't have the storage capacity to hold water from wet years so that we've got plenty in dry years. Instead, we see it wash out to the ocean. Uh, and that is a huge problem. And then we mismanage the water that we do have remaining behind our dams. Again, environmental regulations uh, requiring us to squander huge volumes of water, even amidst a catastrophic drought like the one we just came through, uh, to control water temperatures for fish. New Maloney's is something that many of our residents see every day. And it's, it's scary how low it got uh, during the end of 2015. And even after a fairly normal season, it's still very low. Can, can you help uh, shed some light on why? Well, again, the environmental laws require mass releases of water, of, um, mainly to adjust water temperatures for the fish. Uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, in uh, the case last year, uh, we had an enormous amount released out of New Maloney's to uh, nudge, uh, I think it was a couple of dozen uh, steelhead trout uh, uh, smolts to swim to the ocean, which they generally tend to do anyway, and they all get gobbled up before they get there by non-native predators, which is completely beyond the ability of us to control with water temperatures. But in the meantime, we bleed off huge amounts of water to meet these environmental requirements. We're going to see that right now uh, in the northern part of this district. Uh, uh, with Folsom uh, Lake. Uh, uh, Folsom's about a million acre uh, feet of water storage. Uh, it had to be drawn. It, we saw enormous releases out of that uh, dam uh, for flood control purposes because we didn't have the, the extra capacity to store it. Uh, that water, instead of being diverted to uh, central and southern dams that had plenty of capacity, was instead lost to the Pacific Ocean because uh, they found a dead smelt in the delta pumps and turned them off, or at least turned them way down. Um, uh, so what we're now going to see is because of these environmental requirements, they're going to be holding a lot of water at Shasta for uh, temperature control purposes and bleeding water out of uh, Folsom right now. Uh, Folsom is the main water source for uh, the city of Roseville, which is the biggest city in this district. Uh, it could be uh, uh, drawn back down to catastrophic levels because of these policies. Uh, and the day may come because of these policies that one day uh, uh, people are going to start turning on their faucets and no water is going to come out. What can you do uh, in your Build position? Build more dams. That's, you know, th th this, this is not complicated stuff. I mean, start by finishing the dams we've already started. Everybody thinks the Colorado River is the big river in the, in the West. Sacramento is much bigger than the Colorado. The difference is we store 70 million acre feet on the Colorado. We only store 10 million acre feet on the Sacramento. We lose most of the rest of that to the Pacific Ocean every year. Of, of, of uh, Shasta uh, is the great jewel in our uh, northern uh, California reservoirs. Uh, that was built to 600 feet of vertical uh, elevation. It's supposed to be uh, uh, 800 feet. Uh, they didn't need the extra capacity when they built it in the 40s, so they designed it for 800 feet but left the next generation to finish it. We never did. Uh, adding that final 200 feet of vertical storage uh, uh, for vertical elevation on the dam would create uh, about 9 million acre feet of additional water storage. That nearly doubles the capacity on the entire Sacramento River system just by completing an existing dam. Then you can go upstream of Folsom and, and see the abandoned site 
of the uh, of the Auburn Dam. Uh, uh, much of the construction on it, that is the carving of the footings, was already done in the mid 70s, and then it was we walked away from it. That would be enough water to uh, to, to fill and refill Folsom Lake. Uh, nearly two and a half times. It would also mean 800 megawatts of the cleanest, cheapest electricity on the planet. Uh, that's enough for a population of more than a million uh, uh, people uh, uh, for a year. Uh, and uh, it would uh, provide 400-year flood protection to the Sacramento Delta. I mean, all the billions of dollars we're spending on levee reconstruction in the Delta is to protect us against a 200-year flood. Just completing the Auburn Dam gives us 400-year flood protection in the same region. So, and, and, and that's before we even look at, at building new dams, and there are plenty of sites for that. Uh, 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 the Sites uh, Reservoir, uh, uh, Temperance Flats, uh, we have many, many other reservoirs, both on-stream and off-stream we could be constructing, but we've not constructed a major reservoir since 1979, uh, and we're actually seeing efforts by the environmental left to tear down existing dams. They're trying to do that on the Klamath, four good hydroelectric dams to be torn down there at an enormous cost. And by the way, that cost is going to be paid out of the water bonds that Californians uh, supported, thinking that was going to go to more water storage. And they're actually using that money to tear down existing dams. Everything we hear is that we need to conserve our way out of this drought. What are your thoughts on that? You can't conserve your way out. Conservation is important management tool in a crisis, but it does not add any additional capacity. It manages a shortage. It doesn't solve it. Uh, the only way you solve a shortage uh, is with more capacity. And again, the good news is we live in one of the most water-rich regions of the country. We have plenty of, uh, of uh, geologically uh, appropriate uh, uh, sites for additional reservoirs. Uh, we can store that water very cheaply so that we have it to use in dry years, uh, uh, and, and not only that, but also provide the flood protection and hydroelectric generating capacity uh, that we need. Uh, the problem is we made a conscious political decision not to do that, and we're now living with the result of that decision. It, it dates back to the, the same period of the 1970s when these environmental laws that we were talking about that have devastated our forests were, were enacted. So uh, in the final minute we have, I mean, is there hope to, to change yes, these policies? I, uh, again, these are, these are not you know, mysterious acts of God. These are all choices that we made when we stopped building dams, when we stopped properly managing our forests. We can change those policies the moment we summon the political will to do so. That's what elections are all about. And I think that there is a growing portion of the population uh, you know, that is looking at these policies realizing the human suffering that they're causing, uh, looking at the enormous environmental damage that they have caused, and realizing we've got to change these policies. So I do hold a great deal of hope and increasing optimism uh, that we will see these policies changed uh, uh, within the next decade. Congressman, thank you as always for joining us on the show. We appreciate it's your time. My pleasure. Thanks again for having me. And thank you for joining me on this edition of Inside View. I am your host, Joel Metzger, and I hope you join me next time.